All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, really excited to be coming to you today um, for with People Grove's product philosophy. Uh, before we get going, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, this webinar is being recorded and can be made available after the presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can share that recording with you. Um, also, please ask questions. Questions are very much encouraged today uh, throughout the presentation. You can type those questions into the question box on the GoToWebinar panel. Also, if you face any technical difficulties today, please put those in the question box as well. We'll do our best to manage those as we can. But today, I'm really excited to be talking a little bit about our uh, product philosophy here at People Grove. Um, here is our outline for uh, today's presentation. We'll start very high level with People Grove's mission. We'll talk a little bit about why mentorship matters. I think most of us know that intuitively. We're going to put some numbers behind that as well. Third, we'll talk about some of the problems that we look to solve with our product specifically, and then we'll get into our product strategy and leave some time at the end for Q&A. However, please ask questions throughout the presentation. We'll make sure that we get those questions to our presenters. Speaking of our presenters, uh, we have a wonderful trio from our product team today. Um, I'm going to start real quick by introducing myself. My name is Matt Kelly. Uh, I work at People Grove in a business development capacity. Previously, I spent six years working for Georgetown University within their alumni association where I ran their student and alumni networking platform through People Grove called Hoya Gateway. Let's uh, introduce our presenters today. Tori, you want to get us started? Yeah, so I'm Tori. I am the director of product at People Grove. I'm Eric. I'm a product manager here at People Grove and previously was at Khan Academy uh, before joining the team here. I'm Laura and I'm a user experience designer here. Great. So let's jump into some of our content here. So we're going to start again very high level here with People Grove's mission. Uh, for those of us on the on the line today who uh, were partners of People Grove, um, you know that we are in the game to ensure each and every student and professional has access to the community and connections that they need to succeed. We really want to provide resources to our students and alumni users when and where they need it. Um, and we really believe that relationships and community are the key to student success and engaged alumni. We really think about this as community and connections and how those networking relationships and mentorship relationships can really help our students and alumni succeed when they need to. So why does mentorship matter? I think, again, intuitively, we all really recognize that mentorship has a big impact on our lives. It has had an impact on my life, which is why I chose to work at People Grove. You know, I came from uh, Georgetown University where I graduated with a history and theology degree and tried to go into the business world um, at the height of the recession. Not necessarily the easiest transition to make, but through coaching and guidance from a variety of different people in my life, you know, I was able to get to where I am today, which is great. Uh, Tori, Eric, Laura, anything you want to share about some of your own experiences with mentorship? Yeah, so I was recently uh, with you, Matt, at NACE uh, in Florida, and um, I was chuckling to myself how often I heard um, folks talking about how difficult it is for English majors to find their career path and especially to get into technical fields. So um, I was an English major. I have a master's degree in creative writing. So I all I wanted to do was live on a boat and be a writer back mm -hmm. in the day. Mm -hmm. um, that was also during the recession. I had to find a job. I ended up um, working in publishing and print publishing. Didn't really like that. Um, wasn't sure what to do. I uh, squeezed my way over into a tech um, company, um, working on email and um, doing technical writing. I really wasn't happy with that. Um, I discovered the product team and was like, this is cool. They're creating products. This is really interesting. Started kind of elbowing my way onto the team meetings and getting really involved. And um, the VP of product and uh, Jeremy Dillingham and our uh, people manager, uh, Jen Goldman, actually noticed that initiative. And um, just some like raw talent that I didn't even know I had in this area. And they both pushed me to uh, interview for this job called product management that I didn't even know what it was. I actually had to Google the, the term for product management when I was interviewing for the role. Um, and it's it, it totally changed my life. Um, obviously, I'm now a director of product here at People Grove, and I'm very fulfilled by my work. I wouldn't have even known about this discipline if mentors hadn't have not only um, pushed me to apply, but really helped me make the transition. People are, are correct. It is not easy to transition from an English major into a technical role. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to do it without mentors um, helping me know how to succeed. So, um, yeah. And I think what I love most about your story, 
Tori, is that you know you really think about mentorship, and sometimes we think mentorship is this really overbearing, long-term relationship. You know, it might be very, very high touch and, and a lot of work for the mentor, but it really it seems like nudges here and there from different people along your career path. Just simple conversations really guided you in certain ways and left a really memorable impact on your career path. So I think that's how we really conceptualize mentorship at People Grove. It's not just those time delineated, goal oriented relationships. It's really about light touch conversations, informational interviews, things that really have an impact on students or young alumni or even experienced alumni as they continue to navigate their career path. So let's talk a little bit about mentorship and some of the outcomes that we think that mentorship really has an impact on. I'm going to touch on this on kind of the student life cycle that we see with most of our partners at People Grow. You know, first we think about mentorship along the academic scale. So when students hit campus, you know, even our post-traditional students that we've been talking about in this webinar series previously, you know, they might be adult learners, commuters to campus, um, 25 or older, military experience. You know, when they hit campus, it's still a big transition for them as it is for our traditional student who's 18 coming right out of high school. Um, and first year students with mentors are vastly more likely to return to college for a second year. So thinking about retention, how can mentorship really play a role in bringing students back to campus um, you know, throughout the different points during their academic experience where they may face a challenge. Specifically for traditionally underserved populations, you know, like min minority students with mentors, they're two times more likely to stay in school and even earn better grades. So mentorship has a lot of impact on how students succeed academically during their time at your institution. Uh, this is a research that's conducted by the Society for Community Research and Action. Um, so, you know, there's a source down there if you'd uh, like to kind of look up some of this research here as well. Now we think about career. So as students progress in a traditional four year institution, you know, freshman, sophomore year, we're trying to keep them in school, retain them on campus. Junior and senior year, we're thinking about career outcomes. So thinking about career exploration, thinking about career prototyping, testing out assumptions that they've learned during their exploration phase, and then career outcomes. How do we get them to that job that they really want that's going to provide meaning and purpose in their life? Um, and we find that mentorship has another huge impact on those career outcomes. So students who have mentors that encourage their goals and dreams are twice as likely to end up engaged in their work later in life. Lastly, after they graduate, we see that mentorship plays a role in the alumni life cycle as well. So while on campus, students who are mentored are 4.1 times as likely to be emotionally attached to their alma mater. So thinking about how, you know, if you want to think about how alumni are attached and engaged to your, your institution post-graduation, it's important to touch them while they're students on campus. That's kind of intuitive there, but this is kind of providing some data behind that from Brandon Busteed, um, who talks um, you know, from Kaplan University Partners about why colleges need human capital campaigns. And so putting that number behind why the importance of mentors for the, on the alumni perspective is really crucial to our work with our product at People Grove. Additionally, down the road, we all know that engagement, the end result of that could be philanthropic outcomes. So when you see that attached alumni are twice as likely to donate compared to those who are not, you know, that's an important piece for your alumni relations team to think about, you know, as an outcome from alumni engagement through mentorship. So to sum up, you know, meaningful mentorship matters more. Students who, uh, you know, find value in conversations with mentors are vastly more confident, they're more prepared, and they're more engaged in their work and their life and then with your institution later on down the road as alumni. So this is a crucial part of how we think about our business at People Grove, specifically how we think about our product. So there's a couple of problems and opportunities here. Now we know that mentorship has a huge impact on students' lives, but the fact is, is that not enough students, not enough young alumni have mentors. You know, only 22% of college graduates strongly agree that there was a mentor that encouraged their goals and dreams during their time on campus. So we see this as a problem, right? We, we talked about the impact of mentorship, and if we can't provide that impact while students are on campus, then we see that as a big gap. But it's also an opportunity for us here at People Grove, and then for us with our partners at our you know, institutions that we work with, to really bring the community together to provide that type of mentorship to students across campus and through these resources. And so these are three places where we've identified with the work that we do as ways that People Grove and the products can really help bring those resources to students. So Tori, can you talk us through some of these things? 
Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> as you can kind of see here, you know, we've, we talked so much about the value of mentorship in, in students' lives, even for your institution. There's so many outcomes that are super clear seen through data that matter when students have a meaningful mentorship relationship. But it's not easy for students or, alum, or young alums to, you know, even understand that they need a mentor or to feel comfortable reaching out. So it can be very lonely and confusing. I remember the, the feeling of, of being an English major, having no idea what I was I was supposed to be doing. It was during the recession, and um, it really helped take the loneliness out of the journey to have a mentor. And you know that is what you all do as career and alumni services um, folks at your institutions, um, and also helping students ease into networking. So networking is a scary word. It's kind of a weird word. Why would I need to do this? Um, but as we've seen, extremely helpful. And there are just some skills, some basic things that we can help with on the product side and to, to kind of help ease students into that process. Um, at the end of the day, you all are already doing the good work at your institutions to, to help students to succeed. So we're just really coming along to partner with you and help you scale out what you're doing at your institution. So uh, I don't remember the exact stat map, but it was something like one to 1700. Um, is that correct? Um, in terms of, of folks on staff who are there to support the students on campus, that is not enough people. Uh, so in terms of, of how big the, the gap is, um, it, we want to be able to come help you, uh, create an opportunity for you to scale out what you do and to, to help students and young alumni find those meaningful mentors to help them succeed. Yeah, the, the stat that Tori was referring to is that, you know, we would look at the ratio of students to career services uh, staff members. Um, and what we see on average is that uh, there are 1,700 students for every one career service staff member. Now, you know, at individual institutions, that might look vastly different. You know, I've recently had the good fortune to be traveling and visiting some, some schools across the southeast and learned that um, at some larger schools in Florida, you know, it could be 30,000 students to every one career staff member. At smaller institutions, it might be tilted the other way. Um, but on average, you know, when we think about that number, we think about scale and how can we make sure that students are really getting the resources that they need with, you know, the limited resources on the institution side. Um, so that number is a really a kind of a big driver of how we think about, you know, providing services to our partner institutions. So at this point, I, uh, we're going to turn it over to Tori to talk a little bit more about some of the product strategy um, and some of the high level things that we think about when it comes to the actually implementation of our software. Great. So really at the end of the day, what we want to do is build transformative experiences. And what I mean by those are experiences that mentees are able to, to find somebody who can help transform their life. Uh, so we want to build experiences through our product, through partnerships with you that really drive those meaningful relationships between mentees and mentors. Um, how we how we really do this is um, next slide um, is a few a few reasons a, a few ways so one is um, building partnerships with you all so we're not over here on our own you know trying to solve this problem we're like I said trying to really help scale out what you are already doing well um, so we want to we're collaborating with you all right. and sorry to interrupt but we have a technical issue uh, we're having a little mic check on your end um, good can everyone hear Tori if you can just chat into the question box to make sure that um, we you can hear Tori, that'd be great. Okay, Hello. great. If, if you could just start from the top here with build partnership, that'd be tremendous. Okay, um, yeah, let me know if I cut out again. Um, so yeah, so uh, one of the tenets of how we build products at People Grove is to really partner with the folks who work at the universities, because as we said earlier, um, it's, it's really you all who are doing the good work and we are collaborating with you and hopefully empowering you to create and scale transformative experiences for your students and your constituents. Um, so that's kind of our first tenet. Our second is uh, really around using data. So um, using insights from both qualitative, which is more like user research, speaking with, um, with folks and gaining insights there from conversations, and then quantitative data. So actually looking at the numbers, how are we seeing impact um, from our product if we build something? Are more people coming to use it? Are more people making connections? Um, using those, those numbers to actually be able to quantify if we are making an impact. And then third, 
is really prioritizing um, product initiatives that um, drive connections. So we have a very robust platform at People Grove that um, you know it takes a village to help students and alumni um, make these connections that are transformative, and that is true on the platform side too. So we have a whole suite of products and um, different tools for you all to be able to um, create programs and create different um, types of um, messaging experiences that allow your um, mentors and mentees to make connections so um, and then when we you know there's a million things that we could be doing every day but when we go to prioritize what we want to put on our roadmap we think about how will this feature um, drive connections and like I said we uh, work with you all and we analyze the data to make sure that that's actually happening so I've got a great question from one of the uh, participants around data um, you know we one of the things that's great about the platform is that there's a number of different types of data that can be collected from our partners um, to measure engagement outcomes etc um, you know, how much of that type of, of data, you know, the data that's measured by our partners goes into the work that you think of with the product? How, how much of it in terms of how, how much do we use that data to make decisions off of, or is that? That's the question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, co consistently, constantly. So we look at the data, um, you know, almost daily, uh, I guess even more than once daily. So there's so much going on in terms of, um, you know, what we're working on, if it's a small feature, if it's a large feature, um, not only once we build uh, a feature, once it's out, how is it actually contributing to what we set out to do? Um, so I have some data later that shows like some recent launches and how it was actually driving impact. And then also during the product development process, we're using data. So we also are gonna talk a little bit about doing um, user research and, and reaching out before we even um, build a product but in terms of even on the partner end um, some of our products will build as as betas or as tests where only a certain subsection of partners who have opted in um, will get this product and we'll be able to, to gauge impact based off of the usage um, on on your end so there's another product coming up that I'll show you later that we were able to see from um, the usage from your students that we had um, pretty big increases in connections made great So in terms of build partnerships. Great. So, uh, so in terms, yeah, in terms of building partnerships, um, I just wanted to kind of go over some of the ways that we do this. So uh, last week I was out with, um, as you can see there, with one of my uh, the designers on our team, Igor, um, and the product team who's uh, with me, and then um, some other folks on our team are on basically a, a domestic tour um, meeting with dozens of our partners. And uh, I met with about five schools last week and it was a very inspiring experience. Uh, so here's, I'll go through a few of these experiences. So we were uh, recently at George Washington and you can see Michael McKenzie here. And we also met with one of his staff members, Nicole. And um, you know, they, as you can see a quote there, their goal is for students to feel happy and successful. I'm sure that is uh, um, many of your goals as well. And they also mentioned that they really rely on People Grove to help them do this. So again, it's helping scale out what they do and seeing um, you know, these students coming up kind of a little bit deer in headlights to their career services department trying to figure out what question to, to ask and, and having um, his staff um, kind of sit with them and talk through their, their concerns and really show, show them the platform and how they can use it. Um, it, was, it was inspiring and um, definitely uh, interesting on our end to see how they use the platform. Um, so we also went to recently to visit um, San Francisco State. So I really love this quote. So Orlando, who's the um, in the top left corner there in the photo, is uh, said this quote: "Gator Connect, which is what they call their their People Grove platform, is where you come to be part of our community." So it's really a closed and closed community of alumni and students, where um, students feel comfortable, uh, much more comfortable reaching out to um, mentors than they would say on like LinkedIn or something that's an open community. Um, I like how you talked about it as a walled garden, Tori, in, in previous oh. conversations that we've had, like having those mentors and, you know, really in the community and being engaged and, but, you know, making that experience feel very comfortable for students. Exactly. And even when we were at GW last week, the student was looking at the platform and he, uh, it was the first time he'd seen it. And he said, wait, these are all GW alumni. And I was like, yeah. And I said, how does that, I feel significantly uh, more relaxed about being in this platform because I know it's all people who are from my school. 
Uh, okay. We also went to UMUC and I was trying to squeeze myself into that photo mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with the group there. And uh, this was a very inspiring conversation with, with these folks they are doing, uh, their platform is very engaging, very active. They use the heck out of um, our programs feature and um, they create some very inspiring programs. For instance, something called the Internship Plus program, which is um, about helping uh, students who are a little bit older, so average age of 31, um, help them find careers while they might have families and full-time jobs how do you break into a new job market get an internship when your life is already that full that's what they're trying to do with this internship plus program helping them um, find a virtual or um, uh, different ways that they can make that happen uh, very creative team so I was very inspired by them and then uh, last slide here is um, so I was not on this trip but this is with Temple University you can see a couple members of our team in this photo Ella and Igor and the rest of the team at Temple uh, uh, Temple is expanding their platform they call it owl not own a little typo there sorry about that um, and they're expanding with more hubs and then uh, we recently partnered with them on a product initiative to actually bring in um, on the jobs board to bring in uh, jobs that are actually listed on handshake into our platform so that they could like I said we have a very robust platform you can do a lot with it and um, you know we just kind of brought that feed in so you can see the job listed on our platform they were um, one of the partners in that initiative so one uh, question from a participant today here is um, any of these visits include um, you know some of these institutions using the platform for alumni connecting with other alumni yes definitely so um, let me think who was the specific uh, is it Georgetown who does Georgetown. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so um, definitely we they're not listed on here. I'm mentioning Georgetown because Matt went to Georgetown. So um, uh, th that was definitely um, a program that does alumni to alumni. Uh, not all of about 50% of our uh, folks on our platform actually use the alumni to alumni feature. Um, but yeah, I, I believe there's another one. I'm forgetting who it was right now, but we did meet with a couple of schools who, who yes, use alumni to alumni uh, mentoring as well. I think what's been interesting in my experience with the Georgetown platform has been, you know, as, as alumni continue to kind of come to um, the Alumni Association and back to campus looking for career services, you know, being able to provide them resources is challenging because the Career Center is already, you know, working with a large population of students. Um, so having this alumni network where they can connect with those resources on their own and being able to kind of cultivate that, you know, for Georgetown it's Hoyas helping Hoyas mentality. Um, has been really crucial to kind of the expansion of the program and platform at Georgetown. Um, and so it's, it's been a really, really great thing to see how many alumni are willing to not only support students, but also their fellow alums. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, all right, so I'm the next part we talked about is about analyzing quantitative data. So I'm actually going to um, have Eric, uh, who's a product manager on the team, talk a little bit about how we use quantitative data to drive some decision making for our product initiatives. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tori. So uh, today I'm really excited <laughs> to share some of the more interesting data insights that we've gathered that have informed how we approach product, uh, what we prioritize uh, in terms of improving and building. Um, and this will actually be a little bit interactive. And so Matt, I think you're going to help me with the a little bit of a poll, but we'll walk through some of these questions and then discuss what implications does that have for us as we figure out what we want to build and prioritize. And so the first question for all of us is about what percentage of all people Grove users are students or prospective students? Uh, do we think that's 60%, 50%, 40%, or 30%? And Matt, right. any... go ahead. sorry, go ahead, Eric. Poll time. Poll time. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and give you about 30 seconds to answer the question here. Again, it's what percentage of our users are students? 60%, um, 50%, 40%, or 30%? Seeing some answers come in here is great. About another 15 seconds or so. Got about 70% of the vote in so far. Matt, next time we need some Jeopardy music for, for this <laughs> section. Yeah. I would hum it, but no one wants to hear my singing voice. <laughs> All right, close the poll and I'll share the results here. Um, looks like about, uh, it's an, an even split there at the top, 29, 29, 60% to 50%. Um, so it's a good mix out here actually of, of, of answers. Um, let me go ahead and hide the results here and then go back and show the answer. Yeah, and so if you show the answer, you'll see that the correct answer is actually 40%. And so 
this is uh, you know the distribution of, of results there is uh, it illustrates why it's really valuable for us to look at the data of who is using us, how they're using us, because uh, this informs us that you know 40% are students, but that means for the alumni folks on the call that students are a really really important constituent that we care about. So uh, experienced alumni who are giving back, who are are more likely to be our mentors and folks uh, passing on their wisdom, but also the young alumni, so folks who might be you know, three to five to seven years uh, from graduation, we, we know and see and we'll share some more data about how they are also really actively engaged on the platform. Um, and so uh, the implication for us then, as we look at who is primarily using us, uh, Matt, if you could go to the next slide, uh, is that uh, we are really thinking about the student and alumni constituents as our two really vital user groups and looking at what are the most common goals that these uh, constituents share. So things like, how do I find an internship or job? How do I network with people in my field? Or if you're on the younger side, what career paths or majors am I interested in? And as a product team, we want to know what are the most common, most important goals here that the platform can help you all support. And I think there's a lot of overlap with uh, what we're trying to do here and uh, to help you all scale the impact that you have on your students and alumni. Eric, question from a, from a participant today. Actually, there's two questions here, um, both on the same topic around other users other than students. Um, so primarily, I think most of our partners have, you know, alumni is the other side of that coin, as you said. Um, what about like faculty and staff? Do you have any, any numbers offhand? Um, I know we have a number of partners who bring faculty and staff on as mentors, but we can also have them as mentees, correct? Yeah, so we do, that's absolutely right. We do have a portion of users who are faculty and uh, faculty mentors. We have parents who join the platform. We have uh, professional advisors who join the platform as well. And so uh, they tend to be fewer in number, but at a high level, we think about students and alumni as uh, our two broadest buckets. But that platform absolutely scales and works well for advisors, parents, friends, uh, employers, and other user types. So that's one of the kind of great flexible things about the platform. Uh, and yeah, was we, there a question, Matt, in there? Well, it's interesting because I think, you know, we have a number of partners who do really interesting things around who is a knowledge seeker and who is a knowledge sharer. So instead of thinking like students and alumni very, uh, you know, black and white like that, very, you know, defined, um, we have people who are offering their expertise who might also be seeking expertise as well. So there's a couple of, of points here in the chat about faculty. Um, and how faculty can also be knowledge sharers, but they also might want to connect with other faculty members across campus. Like, you know, if you're an adjunct looking to have a mentor who is perhaps a tenured faculty member, you know, these are things that we can build into the platform, whether it's in, you know, a very defined group or overall for the broad umbrella for your institution, then, you know, those private groups can really be dynamic and really be, uh, you know, helpful for knowledge seekers and knowledge sharers both. Um, yeah, so I, I think, think it's in juxtaposition there. Yeah, and I think the thing to emphasize here is that it's the goals of these uh, of our users that we want to support. So regardless of if you are a freshman or a young alumni, <clears throat> they both might be looking to network at any given point. And so it's about helping your constituents succeed and achieve their academic and career goals, regardless of what traditional bucket they might be in. Great. So next question uh, is, on average, what feature do users spend the most time on? Again, we'll open up a poll here, but we have jobs and internships, uh, the inbox feature, the resources feature, which uh, allows universities to post career guides, other uh, academic and networking resources there, or the discussion forum. And we'll do another poll here uh, and give folks some time to respond. Watching that poll there. So again, on average, what feature do users spend the most time on? Jobs or internships, the inbox, uh, resources, or the discussion board? Um, Hopefully we have, uh, you know, many of our partners on the call today, but if you're not a current partner of People Grove, uh, your best guess here is also appreciated. Um, leave the poll open for about another 10 seconds. Got about 59% of the vote in right now. And going to go ahead and close it and share the results. So the results here are pretty, uh, pretty defined. Uh, looks like most believe that jobs and internships, uh, you know, is the feature that we spend the users spend the most time on. Um, Six percent for resources, and then nineteen percent for the discussion board. Uh, we'll go ahead and reveal the answer now. Drum roll! Drum roll! Everyone, uh, everyone's instincts were right. It is indeed jobs and internships. 
Uh, Matt, we're still seeing the poll on the screen. Did you oh, mean to? Uh, sorry. Thanks for letting me know. No worries. Um, so it is indeed jobs and internships. It's uh, top of mind for most of our users. And the implication for us here is, you know, this confirmed a hunch that we had, but the data uh, really helped us. Uh, well, really helps us prioritize improvements to our most used features. So knowing what our students, alumni, advisors, parents, and others are already getting a lot of usage and value from uh, guides what we, uh, how we tackle things. And so you can imagine at any given point, there are, might be a hundred different things we could do, uh, but this helps us prioritize. Great. Let's it move also, on speaks, to well, it also speaks well to our concern with outcomes too, right? Jobs and internships, that module is very, very directly connected to certain student made product and also alumni outcomes they're looking to do when they're networking. Um, but you know what's unique about I think that feature is that we really try to drive connections within that feature as well. So by you know sharing other resources in the community that might have experience at that particular company or have that internship previously, it's just another way that that connections and community plays in. Absolutely. Great. Another question, Matt. And so for our for folks who on the call who work primarily with alumni, this one this one was particularly interesting to us. So. Let's see what, what folks reply here. So how many years after graduating do alumni make start making the most connections on People Growth? Do they start really engaging one year after graduation, two years after, three years after, or four years after? This time we'll do another uh, opening up of polls and uh, see what your what what folks think. All right, poll is open. Uh, so one year, two years, three years, or four years after graduation here. How many Years after graduating, do the most users do users make the most connections on people growth here? About another 15 seconds on the poll. About 62% of the vote in right now. It's a, a good juxtaposition, good good distribution for answers so far. All right, I'll close the poll now and show the results. So what we see is about 50% uh, say uh, one year after graduation. So it looks like that, you know, that first year after graduating uh, for young alumni is assumed to be like the time where they could use those connections most. Um, I'll go ahead and hide the results now and go back to uh, the slides so we can see what the answer is. Yeah, the answer for People Grows platform is actually three years after. And this was really interesting to us in that you know, we saw that alumni, at least in uh, that have been on our platform for the first year or two, they, they're absolutely connecting and using the platform. But we saw a steep inflection point starting three years after graduating. And so this is something we're looking into to understand, you know, what is happening and it's particular about this three year time frame that we might uh, interact with. And for us, the product implication uh, on the next slide is um, looking at how we might engage, uh, how we might in, sorry, how we I might jump ahead. Uh, a little bit ahead, uh, yeah. but it's just how we might engage with alumni at, in a timely manner when they're likely to be seeking or offering help. So meeting these alumni and student users uh, when it's appropriate, when it's relevant for them uh, in their academic and career journeys in a timely manner. And so the, we're exploring ways in our roadmap to look at that. Um, and the roadmap for, quick explainer on the roadmap is it's just a, a plan for us as a product team that shows which features we are looking to build in based on user feedback, all of this data. And uh, if you want to learn more about our roadmap, uh, just reach out to our university partnerships team and they'd be happy to share more. And I think we have one final question, I believe, Matt. Uh, we're not going to do a, a poll per se for this question, but I think this is interesting to just cover at a high level. Yeah, absolutely. So this one, what percentage of students rate connections on People Grove as meaningful? And the answer here is 90%. And for us, we're really proud and excited uh, to see that uh, data come back from students. Uh, and because for us, it, it really validates that when students reach out to alumni or when alumni reach out to other and make other connections on the platform, it really is valuable and meaningful and transformative. It's not a, a casual, oh, I sent one message, but the we're finding that students rate it as meaningful, that they have an actionable next step and they really get a lot of value out of it. And this really supports our overarching product strategy of driving connections uh, as our theme uh, across all of our users. And so with that, hopefully that was educational and uh, some insight into how we leverage data to guide what we do as a product team. Um, and I think next up, I'll pass it off to Laura to think about 
to share a bit about the qualitative side of things and how we talk to users. Well, we, we have a one question from an attendee here that I think is going to be interesting to cover here. And, and Tori, you can chime in on this as well. But, you know, as, as we continue to learn more and see more data from the platform, you know, and, and that influences the roadmap, you know, sometimes it can be hard when you have a strategy laid out in a roadmap to then have to back up and change the strategy based on something that we learned in a test. So, you know, how nimble and agile do you have to be when you lay out a product roadmap like this? to you know account for the influence of data and studies like the the ones you're conducting with your team yeah it's a really good question that is literally like the job um is exactly that's the challenge right there so um <clears throat> you know what we see is and you'll see in, at the end like some of the features that we're launching sometimes um some of these decisions can be kind of common sense like it's sort of a no-brainer that if you fix if you fix it like, for instance i'll show you at the end like we redesigned the inbox like redesigning the inbox is going to have an impact on connections because actually the third most used feature is the inbox it's kind of the bread and butter of what we do so like for instance that's something you can put on the roadmap and feel fairly confident that that is going to drive impact without having to do a ton of testing around it obviously we're still going to track kpis and still make sure that it is driving the impact that we are uh, believing it will but that's an example of maybe something that um you know we've seen enough data over time that we can make a, an informed decision um ahead of time that we want to um, put resources there. Um, there might be another type of product though where it's, we're maybe a little bit more on the fence about. So we have an idea of something we want to build. Like for instance, um, you'll see that we, um, a little bit later, we'll talk a little bit more about some onboarding um, features that we built. And there were lots of ways that we weren't sure about the implementation about how we actually wanted to build the onboarding experience. So we did actually a bunch of um, testing around, okay, so if we give users um, the option of to see a mentor in one modal with all the information on one page or multiple screens, which one has a more impactful um, impact on the data in terms of having students actually reach out to mentors. And we found that just the single screen was actually more impactful so that is what we built so it kind of depends on the type of feature that we're building or even like within the feature that we're building um, the the um, execution of how we go about building it we'll even use data to inform those decisions um, you know and if we if we uh, it, it mainly um, you know comes again like I said to things that we we're a little bit unsure about the impact so in terms of our roadmap you know there are things on there that are more like big boulder features that we you know it's pretty clear from user research from conversations that we really just need to fix this thing but then there's some other stuff that you know if we do start to iterate and start to see that we're not seeing the results that we want we can be agile and, and nimble and trade those items out for something that we are seeing higher impact great thank you so much that's great context so we'll talk a little bit now eric covered some a lot of the quantitative research that we've been doing into the usage of our product we'll talk a little bit more on the qualitative side and uh, i believe we're going to kick it over to laura Thank you, Matt. Um, next slide. Great. So um, in addition to all the quantitative work that we're doing, we really are focusing on qualitative insights. And um, the type of user research that we do can range anywhere from surveys to usability tests to a variety, even our on-site visits. It's when we're taking information from our actual users, such as our students, our alumni, as well as gathering feedback from different administrators or staff at universities, and then um, having that come into play with our designs. Um, so next slide. Um, so for instance, when we conduct usability tests, that's often happening in early stages of designs. So that means um, we might be prototyping something, we might be um, working on a new feature, and while we're making those design decisions, we want to have informed um, feedback from users to make sure that they understand the interface so that it's clear um, and that it's actually functioning really well. So one recent usability test that I conducted was looking at our new messaging. Again, thinking about um, driving connections between mentees and mentors. We wanted to make sure that um, the messaging was clear and um, concise, and we are looking more specifically at um, a, a tiny feature within it about help topics. So the next slide. Um, whenever we conduct usability research, we kind of follow um, the different experiment um, metrics like setting up learning goals, having a hypothesis, being really grounded in what we want to accomplish from each of these usability tests, and then 
after um, conducting them with users, seeing if we were successful or not. Um, so our next slide. Um, so in the instance of this messaging and thinking about help topics, uh, we focused on users who are aged 23 to 25, looking at um, like current students and also recent alumni, seeing what their input was when they went through um, trying to use the messaging interface and got a lot of great insights out of that. Um, next slide. And then it really is a wonderful way to have iterative um, feedback and so that before we go fully to launch a feature, we're getting um, insights from the users and able to make design changes early on so that we know as we're refining, as we're improving, that it's gonna be accessible and um, really clear to our users um, by the time that we go to launch. So in this specific instance, um, got a lot of insights about how to clean up the interface, um, make it more streamlined, and had some specific design recommendations. So then when we got to a, um, a more final design, our next slide, uh, we were able to make it a lot more clean a lot more elegant um, and then can also again test further with different users to make sure that they understand how to use it and in this instance um, one of the main results was making templates a lot more clear and that would help um, current students who maybe aren't familiar with how to message a mentor it could have them um, have some sort of starting place so that they aren't lost and that they have some um, support when they're form formulating a message to a mentor and Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, sometimes little changes can make a huge difference when it comes to user experience. Correct, correct. Um, because sometimes, you know, uh, designers love to have all kinds of wonderful interactions, but we never want to make something in um, a vacuum, and we never want to make assumptions either about if anyone outside of the design world will un understand what it means. And so, by conducting tests like this, um, it really is being on like a video chat or setting up a moderated test where um, with a student, I will um, prompt them with tasks, see what they do, observe their behaviors, and gather the insights about how we can improve. And Laura, is there an opportunity for our partners uh, to you know, have volunteers participate in these tests? Got a, a question here from one of our attendees around oh, that. Great, <laughs> thank you, Matt. Yes, yes, as much as possible. We really wanna have a constant feedback loop and so um, we truly care a lot about our, our students, our alumni, our admins as well. We really prioritize wanting to make sure the platform is meeting their needs. Um, so as much as possible, as, um, we want to set up calls like this. Um, you'll see Tori's contact information at the end of the deck, but please, 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 if you are interested, give her an email and we can set something up. And it can be you know, anywhere from just 10 to 20 minutes or even a longer session depending on the nature of what we would want to dig into. And I think that the that time frame is actually the most interesting piece for me when I learned about how our product team operates first when I first joined People Grow. Even that 10 to 20 minutes can have a huge impact on some of the things we think about when it comes to the usability of the platform and, and the connections that we try to drive. So uh, yeah, to, to re-echo some of the things that Laura just said, we'd love to have more participants in these types of tests, especially from our partner institutions. Yes, thank you. Great. So, yeah, so the last part is really about um, kind of what I mentioned about prioritization. So how we prioritize um, our features to focus on building connections. So here's a new feature that we just launched um, a couple weeks ago um, that we're calling the admin dashboard. So this is when the administrators come onto the platform um, and they click into their area of the platform. This is the first thing they see. Um, used to be just a page that people didn't even notice, just glanced over as a bunch of real estate that was sitting there kind of unused. So <clears throat> we really wanted to try to take this place and take the actions that could really help improve the user experience and just bring them out of the weeds and put them front and center. So um, the first couple of items that we launched were all about approving users, getting them to complete signups. As you can see, our approvals of new users waiting to use the platform increased by 30%. So um, and that's only in the last like couple of weeks that this is launched. Um, we also have some new modules coming out that are related to um, reaching out and encouraging alumni um, sorry, still on the admin dashboard, um, encouraging alumni to, um, 
to respond or um, mentors to respond if they hadn't uh, responded yet. And then also there's a new one coming out that's called Community Balance. That's about if we're seeing that um, there's an imbalance in the types of disciplines that are represented by alumni or mentors in the platform versus what the students are studying or are interested in, we can point this out and so that you as administrators can reach out and try to find ways to encourage your faculty, your staff, your alumni to come into the platform to support the students and what they're really interested in in learning about. Um, so that's the admin yeah. dashboard. Sorry. To chime in there too, as a former program administrator myself at Georgetown, you know, and leveraging the People Grove platform to really help me drive my programming. You know, what I love about this concept, Tori, is that there are there are action items within this dashboard that really can help me as an administrator understand things that I can be doing to then grow my community, approve my users, increase my response rate, things of that nature. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and that that uh, community balance was sort of driven by you, Matt, in some way. So, um, yeah. So next, uh, connections first onboarding. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, we were watching the data about this new onboarding experience and the pilot product that we've seen, which has been used with um, you know thousands of different students who've come on the platform. We've seen consistently over time a two to three x increase in the percentage of students who reach out to a mentor within the first 24 hours. So if, if we have also seen just in general with product use if people get value out of the product right off the bat they're way more likely to come back and use it again so if if students um, mentees are finding value in the first day that is a good sign for their engagement over the lifetime of their experience um, so this will be launching pretty soon I believe in the next week or two um, and uh, we're really excited to um, to launch this. Uh, lastly, we have, like I mentioned earlier, our new inbox. So it's a redesigned inbox experience. Um, so like I said, this is the third most used um, product uh, on our platform. This is where folks spend time sending the messages, reviewing what they've sent, seeing if they have a pending meeting, setting up calendar invites. Um, we uh, have basically spent a lot of time refining workflows, refining um, the, the usability of this experience. Um, so that we can increase the amount of messages sent, meetings booked, and, and really drive um, connections to stay on platform so that you can report out um, to the people who matter at, um, who matter to you in terms of um, funding or in terms of even like at the end of the year, what did you accomplish? You know, you want to um, be able to say, you know, we increase connections X percent or um, we know that you care also about using data um, in your work as well. So we're, we're trying on our end to make sure that we're keeping communications on platforms so that you can even um, kind of talk about the good work that you're doing as well. And that is pretty much it. If you want to see, we have plenty more um, on the queue, in the queue, on the roadmap. Um, if you want to see more of what it is that we're working on, please reach out to our partnerships team. Um, obviously, my email and maths is at the bottom of the page. You can also reach out to us. And like we mentioned, we would be uh, very excited and happy to work with you. Um, uh, if you're a current partner, um, to you know, do some usability tests or to kind of hear what you're working on and be inspired by, by you all as well. Awesome, thank you, Tori. I got uh, two questions from our attendees. If you have any questions, uh, please make sure you type them into the, the questions box on the, on the webinar panel. Um, Tori, the, the first question has to deal with the, the connections first onboarding. Um, that's available for any knowledge seeker, correct? So for example, if you have an alum who is signing up for the platform and they themselves are looking for help or even a faculty member who is looking for help, is that Connections First onboarding available to them, to them as well? So I'm gonna let Eric answer this question. Yeah, so that's a, a great question, Matt. Um, it will be available uh, absolutely for all students and it will also be available for alumni and pe with people in communities where that alumni to alumni mentoring and connections is enabled. So for those knowledge seekers, it will absolutely be, be turned on. And if a community has maybe an advisor or these other communities where they would also like to see this feature, um, they can definitely reach out to us and we have the ability to turn it on. Since uh, on the students and alumni side, that's where we see the vast, vast majority of the connections being made. They'll, they'll see it first, but we have the ability to turn it on for other knowledge seekers as well, if desired. Thank you. And then uh, two more questions. We had one more pop in as we uh, were answering that one, but um, how are these changes and these updates and, and you know some of the work that you all are doing, how are they being communicated with our partners? 
Yeah, so um, recently we've actually worked quite a bit on updating our communications and launch process around all of our new updates. So we're doing a, a bunch of different things. So um, I, I spoke with a dozen to maybe even 20 or so of um, our different partners actually to ask them this direct question. If, if we're launching at this pace and with these types of new features, um, you know, how does that make you feel? Like, how do you want to be communicated with? And it got a little, a lot of good feedback about that. Um, one um, approach that we're actually taking is that um, that some folks can actually even be given a little bit more time to um, opt in to some of our product features. So um, we are it, also one thing that I'd like to point out is it's not just us who are communicating with the with our partners. So we have a whole fantastic um, strategic partner management team who works directly with the customers, um, with our partners. So. Um, we are not only communicating on our end uh, multiple weeks in advance when we're going to be doing a launch, which is something that you had all requested, and then the day of or the day before. Um, we're also sending out a product announcement email that goes out. Um, we're doing things like these webinars, for instance. Um, we're even, even going to be starting more of like a public-facing product blog. So that's the communication on our end. But you'll also be able to communicate directly with your strategic partner manager who can help you understand what this project is all about, how it matters to you, and even if you're not quite ready to turn on, say, like um, the brand new admin dashboard, because um, that you know seems like a lot to learn all at once, you actually are able to um, take a pause on that and and work through, get some training first before you are you have that enabled on your platform. Um, so for all these ways, we know that um, you know these these new um, developments can be um, very exciting, but also very um, you know, it does take a second sometimes to learn new workflows. And so we want, we're definitely wanting to be as um, respectful as, as possible and to partner with you all so that you can still continue to get your jobs done, still support your constituents. Um, so that's both through communication, through kind of allowing you to um, possibly uh, wait a little bit for the launches. And then also, you know, you can lean on your strategic partner manager team to really help you um, with that process. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the, the last question, there are a couple of questions in the chat that are a little bit, you know, platform specific around setup and architecture. And, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to reach out to you after the webinar today to talk a little bit more uh, in detail about how we can help with those specific needs. Um, but the last general question I'd like to, to just kind of cover today is, um, and, and for, the, for the, the attendee that asked the question, if I, if I misconstrued this question, please kind of correct me in the chat box. But the question is, how are you working to meet the needs of partner fundraisers? Um, which uh, to me is advancement. So we're thinking about like, you know, fundraising out of the alumni office. You know, we spoke earlier about the concept of, you know, um, engagement, meaningful, sustained, purposeful, and having that lead down the road of philanthropic outcomes. Um, I'll kind of take this question because this is kind of the, the realm that I was, I was living in at Georgetown uh, before I moved to People Grove. But, you know, thinking about how uh, we are engaging our alumni, whether they be young alumni or more experienced alumni, um, in a volunteer aspect and engaging them in that meaningful way, we did see some you know, good results in terms of participation rates um, in certain capital campaigns. Um, and you know, our volunteers were really engaged in a way that led them to give philanthropically um, you know, after uh, you know, their engagement. Um, that wasn't the primary goal of what we were trying to accomplish at Georgetown. We were really using this as a volunteer opportunity, a way of engaging alumni in a really powerful way and providing them with help that they needed for their community or for their own career path. Um, the second way is it, it can really be a great stewardship opportunity for some of your major gift uh, donors. And it's a great way to bring those who are passionate about students, whether that be scholarship students, whether that be you know, a certain club or organization, uh, whether that is you know, even graduate students or specific programs, bringing them into the platform and really having them engage with the students and alumni that they're looking to touch um, can be a great stewardship opportunity there. Um, and I hope I covered that that well for, for our attendee who asked that question. Um, again, there's a, a lot of, of some specific questions around the architecture. We'd love to reach out to you um, and talk more about what you're thinking of with that um, and, and talk a bit about how we might be able to set something up um, with our platform that really helps meet the needs. I think that's the, the biggest part that I'd like to just highlight about our own partnerships team is that we really want to help you think about what needs you have on your campus and how we might be able to align with what we do um, to provide the resources that are going to meet the needs. Um, so we'll certainly reach out to you after the webinar today. Um, the last couple of things I just want to point out very quickly um, is we've got a lot of stuff going on this summer. Not only is the product team on the road, 
Um, but you know, our, myself uh, and our CEO and CTO are are traveling all over the country. Um, you know, this this year to uh, to talk to schools and run certain events. We have our big conference coming up July 16th and 17th. Um, we'll be welcoming a number of keynote speakers, including Farouk Day and Brandon Busteed. I'm really thrilled to to have both of them speak about their own experience. Um, you know, I would highly encourage you to take a look at some of Brandon Busteed's work. Um, in around human capital campaigns. He's published quite a bit in Forbes. Um, and then Farouk Day has a wonderful TED Talk um, that we're excited to welcome him to our conference to, to chat about some of the integration of mentoring into the, the uh, learning and life design for students on campuses. Um, we also have a number of free resources available. A lot of the data that we work with mentoring and a lot of the things that we are publishing now you know, are around um, you know, really data-driven and really about some of the needs that we see across campus. Um, so you can visit this website to see some of our white papers here, um, as well as check out our events. Um, as I mentioned, we have had the great, the good fortune to travel across the Southeast so far and do a number of uh, success summits. Um, and we still have uh, 14 more to go. Um, so hopefully we're coming to a neighborhood near you. Um, and you can visit summersummits.peoplegrove.com uh, to learn more about these events. Um, and hopefully we can see you there. Um, it's going to be really great. We've learned a lot so far from just the four events that we've done. Um, and we're thrilled to continue this event series throughout the summer. Um, but I'll finish with this slide and, and have our information up here. Um, I'm Matt at peoplegrove.com. Tori is Tori at peoplegrove.com. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and really appreciate your engagement today um, and look forward to hopefully seeing you uh, at a future People Grove event. So I want to thank Tori, Laura, and Eric. Um, really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, looking behind the curtain a bit and giving uh, our attendees a, a glance into how we think about what we do. So uh, everyone have a great day and, and thanks again and look forward to, uh, to, to the next month's webinar. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.